am the resurrection and the life. Ye who believeth in me shall never die, but shall have eternal life. As Christians everywhere, and particularly on this day, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day, we celebrate this because we know it to be true. And so we enter into his gates with thanksgiving, we come into his courts with praise. We shall praise his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness, even to all generations. Good morning, First Baptist Church in America. And happy Easter. Happy Easter. Oh, we can do better than that. Good morning, First Baptist Church in America. And happy Easter. Happy Easter. We are the flagship church of the American Baptist Convention of, of the American Baptist Churches USA. Built here on this solid ground and gathered by Roger Williams himself. We're not on the top of, of College Hill. We are at the foot of College Hill. And we're here because we want to be sure that the least, the last, the lost, and the lonely can run, walk, or even crawl here, if they have to, and into the everlasting arms of the God Almighty. To our members, let me say it's always wonderful to be in your midst and to see us all here week after week. And to the visitors, if you're here for the first time, or the second time, or you're back after having been away for a while, Welcome back. Finally, let me say that our pastor, Dr. Jamie Washam, is away for the next several weeks on sabbatical, and we miss her. But her absence has given us the opportunity to invite in several top flight pastors. And you can't get any more top flight than our speaker this morning, <laughs> the Reverend Nancy Forstrom. Reverend Forstrom is a native of, uh, of Rhode Island and grew up here in uh, being active in the First Baptist Church here. She holds a Master of Divinity degree from Andover Newton Theological Seminary, was ordained by our congregation, and recently celebrated 35 years of ministry. She has served on the regional staff in Connecticut, on the national ABC USA staff, and as the senior minister of two ABC churches in Connecticut. She recently retired from full-time ministry, moved back to Rhode Island, and currently works at the First Unitarian Church of Providence as director of operations. I know you will look forward to meeting Nancy at the close of the service. Now, if you are able, Please stand and join in reading the responsive call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. <clears throat> Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. My heart is glad and my soul rejoices. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no God apart from you. God has shown us the path of life. In God's presence, there is fullness of joy. Christ is risen indeed. Let us worship the God of the new life. Now please remain standing as we join in singing with all the strength that we can muster. <laughs> Hymn number 234, Christ the Lord is risen today. The Easter Hymn.
Our scripture today is most of the last chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. And I say most of it because I've taken out some of the repetitive pieces to sort of um, encapsulate the message and make it a little easier to listen to. You are certainly uh, welcome to follow along if you would like in your pew Bibles, and I am reading from the New Revised Standard Version, Matthew 28. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. And there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came and rolled back the stone. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers and sisters to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests everything that had happened. And after the priests had assembled with the elders, they devised a plan to give a large sum of money to the soldiers. You must say that his disciples came by night and stole him away. If this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but they doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Please pray with me. Loving God, speak to us that we might hear the words you need us to hear on this day. And be with us as we seek to do your will now and forever. Amen. Amen. So how many of you have had life with no bad days? <laughs> days when nothing happened according to plan, everything was calm and worry-free. And uh, let me warn you, if you raise your hand, I'm going to really be worried about, it. <laughs> about where you've been hiding these past years. How many of you have found the passage in the Bible where either Jesus or God promised us a calm, worry-free life once we decided to follow them? We will not find such a passage, right? Because it is not there. And why should it be? I cannot think of a single person in the Bible who lived a life with no challenges or setbacks. Or without a friend or a family member who met with tragedy or anything like that. In fact, as we know, Jesus did not enjoy an easy life, right? And neither did his followers. So, let's look at Jesus and his followers and what their lives were like for a few minutes. I invite you to put yourself in the story. Choose a person that you are going to be, maybe a disciple. Uh, perhaps a person who hosted them in one of the towns that they traveled through. Maybe someone who prepared a meal for them. Maybe the person who supplied the donkey for the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, who clearly must have been a follower 
whether others knew it or not, right? Or you might be someone who was healed. Decide who you will be. Are you ready? And come on a journey with me. So there were those first heady days when grown men had left their jobs and people were beginning to gather and listen. Remember when Jesus went up the mountain followed by a very large crowd and proceeded to turn everything that we had learned upside down. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. Wait, what? We thought it was all about power. Does this mean that we, ordinary people, have a place within God's space? When Jesus says that money and wealth are not a sign of God's grace, can that possibly be true? Is it true that some wealth is greed and that all greed is bad? Wow. This is good news. Especially since Jesus also told us that day that God hears us when we pray. Hears us. Hears us. That God is a compassionate and patient God, a forgiving and loving God, a strengthening God, not a God who takes advantage of those who have less. This is just unlike anything that we have ever heard before. Days like that were good days. But then, of course, the scribes and the Pharisees, our own religious leaders, started hearing about the things that Jesus was saying. They were jealous, and they were petty, and they played dirty. They kept following Jesus around, not to hear him, but to trick him. They wanted to get him in trouble somehow. They tried to get him to say bad things about Caesar so that the Romans would come after him. They challenged nearly everything that he said, saying that he didn't really know what he was talking about, that he was making it up. Not a week went by that we were not hounded by someone, sent by the chief priests. Not a day went by when Jesus did not have to defend himself against desperate accusations. Days like that were bad days. But there were the disciples, 12 loyal, ordinary people who listened to Jesus and tried to understand and tried to do the right thing. There was even a time that Jesus sent them out across the countryside two by two, giving them very specific instructions on how to spread the good news. Now, the good news, we've started hearing a lot about that, haven't we? The disciples preached that God was nearby, not in some distant place where he couldn't possibly notice, never mind care about us. They encouraged everyone to hear and to change their ways and to come and follow. At the same time, Jesus was also traveling from town to town. So many came to him to be healed, either physically or spiritually or emotionally. And he healed them. He encouraged them to keep seeking the faithful road. He taught them that their individual lives mattered and that they were worth receiving the love of God and the care of others. He told many wonderful stories. He used examples from our own lives to show how good and gracious God is, like the shepherd who went after that one lost sheep and the woman who searched for that one lost coin. Whether we heard Jesus or the disciples talking, the message was clear. Each one of us matters, and each one of us is welcome into God's world. Days like that were good days. But then, of course, Herod had to get into the act. None of us like Herod. He's supposed to be one of us, but we all know that he's a puppet of the Romans. Again, he's only interested in what he can do to keep himself in good graces. And there's his wife, who's even worse. And that is how John the Baptist died. John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, a prophet in his own right. But the capriciousness of cowards like Herod is hard to combat. And we all knew that John was in trouble. Those days were bad days. 
But then there were the crowds, hundreds of people, thousands of people. Wherever Jesus went, the people found him. Those who met him spread the word about how kind he was. Those who were, who were healed could not stop talking about him. And it's not like Jesus tried to hide who he was or what his message was. He stood right there in public places on mountaintops, in places of worship and learning, where he was sure to come up with a lot of people. He welcomed everyone. And that was one of the greatest things about him. When his disciples tried to keep order by shooing the children away, Jesus said, oh, no, you don't. The ones who come to me with the innocence of a child are the ones who most understand what I'm saying. Jesus tried in so many ways to let people know that things that they had heard before that the ways that they had been treated were wrong. We know that in the day, children were at the bottom of the pile, but not in Jesus' world. He recognized and utilized their gifts and accepted their adoration. After all, remember the five loaves and the two fishes? Where did those come from? It was a boy who offered those to help feed the crowds. Jesus fed groups of more than 5,000 people at least twice that we know of, and just with the meager gifts of those who others would have called the least among us. Jesus let it, be, let it be known that there is enough for all of us if we go about it the right way. They even collected so much food that there was enough left over for the widows and the orphans, those who spent all day scrambling for food and didn't have time to sit and listen. Those days of miracles fueled by generosity, those were good days. But of course, the scribes and the Pharisees just would not give up, right? Over and over, they gave Jesus a hard time about doing things on the Sabbath. They tried to make him the bad person because he was taking care of hearts and souls on the day of rest. Now imagine having to argue that healing someone who was dreadfully ill could not wait until the Sabbath was over. Imagine being held to such a tight legal standard that helping another was considered a sin. Those encounters always made us frustrated and angry. Those days were bad days. And then, well, then there was the parade. You remember the parade, right? We all love the parade. Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, just as if he were king. And the people treated him like a king, going before and after, shouting, Hosanna, save us, like he were indeed the new king to be crowned, the one they had been waiting for. So many people recognized him by this point. So many people had hope because of him. It's no wonder that the crowds followed, shouting and rejoicing and dancing in the street, it's no wonder that for a few minutes, the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests and the Romans and the governor were all forgotten. It's no wonder that people right then were not afraid. The Savior had come at last. That was a really good day. But of course, the leaders finally had the last word. The chief priests were able to convince Judas to betray Jesus. Herod was able to get the Romans to arrest him and try him. Jesus was the one thing they could all agree on, that one of our leaders had the nerve to stand up and say out loud that he had done nothing wrong. They were all afraid, afraid of what they might lose, afraid of being seen as weak, afraid of dropping their guard and admitting that there might just be another way. And so they took him, they asked him questions, but refused to listen to the answers. They succumbed to the pressure and they killed him. Killed him for daring to say that God is love. Killed him to save themselves. Those were very bad days, the darkest days of all. But today, today is a whole different story because the leaders have not had 
the last word, because God is in charge, because the women both saw the messenger at the tomb and then also saw Jesus, the risen Jesus, the one we thought was gone. And Jesus did what he had always done, calm our fears, encourage our faith, set us out on a mission on his behalf to tell the other disciples what they had seen. And then everyone else saw him too. He met them, he saw their fear and their joy. He told them to remember, remember everything that he had taught them, and then in turn to teach others. He reminded them of what he had said many times, that he must be turned over to be killed, but then rise again. And now we realized what that meant. Now we realize that Jesus' stories about the kingdom of God were not idle tales, because we are living in the times that God has created. Now we realize that God keeps promises. That when God says death cannot defeat us, it is true. Now we know that what used to be fear is now confidence, certainty, that we will be able to live with God forever. Now we can look back at everything that Jesus told us and be sure that he knew what he was talking about. Now this, this is a good day. Because now we understand the resurrection is not just for the body and not just for the dead. It is also for the tired souls and the hopeless hearts. The resurrection is also very much for the living. When I was in college, one of my best friends was murdered. And we didn't know what happened, and we didn't know who did it, and it haunted me for years, years. I just couldn't stop focusing on the day and the way she died. It would come back and bite me at times when I least expected it. And it took years, years of being a pastor when her birthday, which was just this past week, fell on Easter Sunday. And I realized that I was doing God and her a disservice by spending so much time thinking about how she died that I was in danger of forgetting about how she lived. She was light and faith and kindness. And that year, I moved over to celebrating her spring birthday instead of that dark day. And that was better still followed me. And then, 39 years and 11 months after she was killed, the person who killed her was found using new advances in DNA research. And once they found him, he confessed everything and is now serving a life sentence in prison. And at that time, I learned two things. One is that closure is not what you might expect. And that's a whole other sermon. And two, I gained new insight into how Jesus' death and resurrection could have so much power over our lives. Because the man who killed Helene said when he was being interviewed that he was probably born to be a serial killer but that there was something about her that made him stop. She couldn't save herself, but he claims that she saved a lot of others. If the life of one person, one young woman, the grace and generosity of spirit that she had could save, I don't know, two or three, 10 or 15 others, if her light had that much power, how much more power to save all of us came out of that act of sending a son to people, many of whom were not ready to hear his message, seeing him put his life on the line for those people 
and then bringing the light back to life on behalf of the world. All I know is that I finally realized in my heart and in my head that Helene did not need to be resurrected, but I did. I had been keeping her in her grave, but she's been fine all this time. She's been with God. And that's what Jesus' followers learned on that first day. That death has no power over the love of God. That they had nothing to fear. That they, not the scribes, not the Pharisees, the chief priests, Herod Pilate, nor the Romans, they had the last word. They and God. We know that the disciples who became the apostles and the rest who followed Jesus over the years did not have an easy time. They themselves started out doubting, right? And the chief priests even paid the guards to lie about the resurrection. We know that it was not all sweetness and light as they tried to do what Jesus had told them to do. And they were persecuted from every side. We know that for years they tried to spread the good news and they and build communities around Jesus' teaching and then reach farther out into the world. As they did all that, they continued to have good and bad days. We know that to this day it is not easy to be a child of God and a follower of Jesus. We know that the world is not perfect and that our lives are not always safe and fun. But we also know that they kept going. And because of them, we are here and we can keep going. We know that Christ is risen. And because of that first day, no matter what else, every day after it has been the best day. Amen. Thank you.